Hello, this is the first video in a playlist that I'm calling Parameter Estimation. And this first video deals with frequency substitution, which is a specific case in a bigger class called empirical substitution. And we'll touch upon both of those, but the emphasis is on frequency substitution. Now let X take on K unique values, and we're generically going to call them or label them as 1, 2, you know, through K. And the probability of each category is PI, you know, for each K. And of course, they have to sum to 1 to make it a probably mass function. Let x1 through xn be a sample of size n. So th these values that these assume are 1 through k. And let's let q be a function, a real valued function of the unknown parameters p1 through pk. Now let t be a function of the sample which means, you know, i.e. a statistic. And this is our sample. And we want to use it to estimate this function of the unknown parameters. Now, if we think about it, our goal is that our test statistic, not test statistic, our statistic, we want it to be pretty darn close to this function of the unknown parameters. That's the goal. Now, let me introduce the empirical distribution and that is the p sub n of j and it's equal to 1 over this sum and this is an indicator function which what it does it goes through each sample and checks to see if it equals j so you know did we draw from the jth category and it adds them up and then we can generically call this n sub j where n is the number that of in our sample that equals j now, frequency substitution is we estimate the ith probability with the ith empirical distribution, p sub n of i. And we do that for all k. And that's actually frequency substitution. Now, to estimate this function of the unknown parameters, we estimate it with, you know, we call it q hat because it's an estimate or an estimator depending upon if we put specific values or generically leave the random variables here. Uh, we put in the empirical uh, sub, uh, distribution or the frequency you know, of our categories. It's the empirical distribution. So now here's a quick example. Let's roll a weird six-sided die n times and let x1 through xn be the results. Now part one is let's let this function of the unknown parameters just be pj. So we're picking off the j probability of, you know, category j. And so we let our estimate be this q, this function, but we plug in the empirical distribution. So the, you know, we substitute the frequencies that we obtained in here. So this estimate just becomes p sub n of j. You know, right? Because it just picks off the j uh, component, which is this, and then we estimate it with this uh, the frequency for the empirical distribution of the j category. Now, let's let this q function be this. So it's the sum of the probabilities of rolling or obtaining an even, or yeah, or rolling an even minus the probabilities of rolling an odd. So to estimate this, let's let our statistic be this Q function, but we plug in the frequencies of each category, the empirical uh, distribution. And then that can be shown to be this. And that's it. That's frequency substitution. Now, a note that Pn converges, P sub n of j converges to Pj. And to see this, we let n go to infinity of this quantity. And of course, this quantity is this. Now the law of large number says if we're summing up, you know, you know, independent identically distributed random variables, and the sample is, right, that sample is IID divided by N, then this quantity goes to just the average of this quantity, which is here. Now this is an indicator function. It's either value 1 or 0. So you take 0 times the probability that X is not J, which is 0, plus the probability of 1 times, you know, plus 1 times the probability that x is j. Well, that's just this, which we know is pj. 
So it, it does converge to this. So it's what's called consistent. And then by the continuous mapping theorem, if Q is continuous, then Q hat converges to Q. And you can see that by this. So this is our estimate. We plug in these uh, frequencies and each component converges to its the respective parameter, population parameter. And since Q is continuous, then that estimate converges. Now, what if the P's are functions of unknown parameters? So there, there's K categories, and these P1 through PK represents the probability of each category, but those probabilities rely on some other parameter. You know, could be a vector of parameters. And here's an example. I have a video called EM Algorithm Multinomial Example, and where I use this example, and in this video I quote the book where I got the numbers and the example. But it's essentially there's three categories, and these are the probabilities of each category. Now, granted, we want to estimate the probability of category one, probability of category two, probability of category three, but to do that, we have to estimate theta. And once we know theta, or come up with an estimate for it, then we can estimate these cell probabilities. So in this example, n was 197, and in the sample, there were 38 of them that were category one, category two had 34, category three had 125. Now that creates these empirical probabilities or these cell frequencies, right? Now to estimate theta, what we do in here is we back solve for theta. So multiply by two, subtract it over, subtract, and we, and we get this, but we to find the estimate, we put in our empirical results which is this. So plug that in and then we get an estimate for theta of 0.164. Now note that we could have used this one here. So we'll multiply by four and then put the empirical results for P2 or category two and we would get this. An estimate would be 0.69. And we can do the same thing for category three, back solve for theta and then plug in the empirical results and we get an estimate of 0.538. Now, the take home message to this, oh, first of all, if you were to do this, this, and it's actually pretty straightforward, the maximum likelihood estimate of theta in this case is 0.6268. So the take home message of this example is that the estimates in frequency substitution are not unique and they're often biased. And so that's a, a take home message of using this method. Now it's easy to do, very easy to do, and it often is an estimate that's used for deeper algorithms to come up with estimates, which we'll all get into in this playlist, uh, parameter estimation. Now remember I said frequency estimation is a specific case of empirical substitution. Now I want to spend some time on this, you know, a page and a half, and this is going to kind of come up in other methods to estimate parameters. So first of all, you need to watch the background video on Riemann Stilts integration for statisticians. It's actually a good methodology to have in your statistical tool bag anyway. Now, let's let X be distributed with F with a parameter in the parameter space omega and let F be the density or the probability mass function and Q is a real valued function of what we want to estimate. Now, if Q can be written as a function of the CDF, the following applies. And the following is what I'm getting ready to do. But when it means to be a function of the CDF, it says that this function of the unknown parameters is actually equal to a function of the CDF. Now, at first that seems so weird to me. And it's like, how can that even be possible? So let me give you some examples. So let's let x be normal, mu sigma squared. So the, the theta is, you know, it's a vector, mu and, and sigma squared. So let's let this real valued function of theta be mu. So we're just picking off the first component, which we know is the expected value of x, which we know is, you know, the integrate x times the, you know, the density. But in, in Riemann-Stilts notation, it's this, right? 
Now, X is, you know, we could put T or W or Y. It's kind of a dummy variable. The real unknown is capital F, right? And so this is truly a function of the CDF, right? So the mean is a function of the CDF. In the same way, if we want to estimate sigma squared, you know, it's, it's this, the integration of X squared, of course, minus mu squared. And mu squared, we know is a function of F. And this is a function of f, so it can actually be written as a function of the CDF. And we can go on and on and on. There are so many things that can be written as functions of the CDF. Let's say if we want the jth moment, you know, so q is this, which is the expected value of x raised to the j, which in integral no Riemann-Stilts integration notation is this, which this is clearly a function of f. Um, example two. Let x be binomial, where n is known, and let q, our function of the unknown parameter p, be this, which we know is the probability that x equals 2, but that can be written as f of 2, this is the CDF, minus f of, you could actually put 1 in here because it's discrete, but generically you write it as, it's the left limit approaching 2, that's what this dash means. But in discrete case, that you could just put one, you know, the next lower value. And look, that's a function of the CDF. So many things. And if you can write it as a function of the CDF, then empirical substitution holds. Now, here are the empirical distributions. F sub n of x is this, right? It's how many of the, in the sample are less than that value. And this is a probability, empirical probability distribution, p sub n of x being in this set A, um, which is this, how many of in our sample fall in set A. Now, when x is discrete, that can take on specific values. You know, it doesn't have to be a set. But in the probability sense, or a continuous case, it you know has to be sets. Otherwise, it equals zero. So very quick examples here. So now let's use empirical substitution to come up with an estimate of mu. So mu hat, which we said was a function of the CDF. So our estimate is we plug in the empirical CDF, which is this. And if you watch that video on Riemann-Stilts integration, this is this sum, which is x bar. So empirical substitution provides a very reasonable estimate. Now let's come up with an estimate of sigma squared. And it was a function of the CDF. So let's put in the empirical CDF, which then becomes this. You know, mu, we have an estimate for that up here. So that becomes mu squared. But this integrates to the sum, one over the sum of xi squared. And then this can be written in this form, which that that's a very reasonable estimate for sigma squared. It's actually the maximum likelihood estimate. Both of these are. Now, the last, oh, the, the, the jth moment is actually a function of the CDF. So an estimate would be plug in the empirical CDF, which is this. And then Riemann-Stilts integration shows it's this. But now look at this. This is going to start approaching method of moments, which is actually the next video. So I won't talk more. But empirical substitution is, is a method of moment, has method of moments as a specific case. Um, the last example, and then we'll call it quits, the estimate, the probability of 2, which we said was a function of the CDF, but it could also be written as a function of this probability, empirical probability. So you plug this in, which was the frequency substitution. So you plug that in for P, and then this is our empirical substitution estimate for the probability that X equals 2. Well, that's all I have for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. This playlist is actually going to be pretty fun. We're going to try to go in depth into all these ways to estimate the unknown parameter. Some would call it a point estimate. Some just call it estimators. I'm going to call it parameter estimation or parameter estimators. So hopefully you enjoyed this. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.